Ciao friends, welcome to another video from SQL BI. In this video, we're talking pie and donut charts, some of the most commonly known and understood chart types that have been around for over 200 years. Pie and donut charts are really well liked by some people, they find them simple and even elegant, and they use them in their reports. However, a lot of data and design professionals, including us at SQL BI, have put forward a rule that you should avoid pie charts in your reports and choose instead for other chart types, which can be more effective. We've talked about a lot of different rules in our articles and our videos, and rules like this, avoid pie charts, they can be helpful for beginners or when you don't have a lot of time, but the simple truth is that sometimes, in these real world scenarios, you have to deviate from these rules in order to get the best outcome or the outcome that you want. Sometimes, a pie chart or a donut chart is just fine, and it might actually be the best chart type for your scenario. Knowing when to deviate from these rules is something that can be challenging to do. So what we're doing today is we're going to explain why this rule exists, avoid pie charts, and how come you can use pie charts in certain circumstances when it makes sense. We'll give a few different examples of when pie charts are ineffective, and a few examples of when using a pie chart might be perfectly fine. Because at the end of the day, using a pie chart certainly isn't the end of the world. So with that, let's take a look at our first pie chart in our report. Most people have made or at least seen a pie chart before. Making a pie or donut chart is super easy and it's no different in Power BI. All we have to do is just select the visual from the core visuals available here. And then on the canvas, choose a measure, for example, total quantity of sales, and then channel. And we can see that looking at the largest slice that our online sales account for proportionally much more of our total sales compared to what we've sold in our retail stores. Now, if we wanted to turn this into a donut chart, it would just be a matter of selecting the donut. Now we have that additional white space. A lot of people like that because it makes the chart feel or look less overwhelming. It's up to you. But you can also do some additional formatting like increasing that inner radius, you can even add something in here like a number such as the total. And with some additional formatting, you might end up with something like this. Sticking with a pie here, but it might as well be a donut chart, who knows. And this could work if we have two categories like this, retail and online sales. Let's say we're making a report that's focused on our units sold, and we're trying to drill down into why our online sales are so high, what are we selling, but we want to have something like this at the top of our report to maintain that high level overview of this proportionality, how much of our online sales, uh, total sales comes from our online channel. Now, right out the gate, are pie and donut charts bad? Are they evil? Should you avoid them all the time? No. However, in general, there are many scenarios where a pie or donut chart might not make sense. And instead, you could use a different chart type. So for instance, when there are many categories, we can immediately see that this is visually overwhelming. There's a lot of colors. Many of the colors are very similar and it's just not very precise. We can't really compare the red and the brown slice so well. And this is something that is much better done in a different chart type, like a bar chart, or if we format it a little bit differently, a lollipop chart where we can clearly and easily see games and toys is higher than home appliances, for example. It's all about understanding what are you trying to show? What questions are you trying to answer? What are your users trying to get out of this information that you're displaying? So that you can make good choices of which charts do I want to use? Scenario one, too many categories. Scenario two is when we're trying to compare to a target. In this case, having two pie or donut charts, one for current year, one for previous year, like a year over year analysis, this just doesn't work. If we wanted to compare current year to previous year, both for total as well as for our categories, we would be entirely dependent on the labels here. Now, this is much less effective than if we just want to, for example, focus on our channels, like with a bullet chart, to look at the current year sales versus a target and then quickly see, hey, our online and our retail sales are lower than last year. This is a much better way to show that information. 
if we really wanted to retain the total picture, looking at the total sales as well, we could use, for example, a stacked bar chart. So if I add into the filter context 2018, our previous year, we can easily see that our current year in total is less than our previous year, but we maintain the picture with a breakdown by our retail and online sales. So in this case, comparing to a target is also not something very appropriate for a pie chart or a donut chart. Now, what if we are trying to break down our margin? What if we want to, for example, show a negative number? Well, in that case, for example, when we want to show how our cost breaks out into our sales to make our margin, we just cannot show that cost as a negative number. We could show it as a positive number, but that just doesn't really make sense. It makes much more sense when you look at it in a waterfall. These are our sales, this is our margin, and we get there by subtracting these costs. Very visually clear, very precise, no ambiguity. So these are three examples of when a pie chart or a donut chart might not make sense, and you could use a different chart type instead. Again, this doesn't mean that pie charts and donut charts are bad, but it just means that there are many scenarios where a different choice might be better. The rule and other rules that we give can be applied in general when you don't have time or when you're a beginner and you don't know the context or the detail of these underlying principles, but there are going to be cases when you have to deviate from these rules to get the best outcome. The simple truth is that these rules and other rules that we've presented in the past they don't guarantee success. There is no list of rules that you can follow or best practices that are going to guarantee that you're going to have the best outcome, that you're going to have a successful report or a successful data model. Rules like always make a star schema, never make calculated columns, avoid bi-directional relationships, don't use pie charts, don't fill your report with red, these kind of things in general, can make sense for most scenarios, but in the real world, you're going to run into exceptions, you're going to run into limitations, you're going to run into the chaos and mess that is reality, and you will have to deviate from these rules to some extent. What is important is that you can understand when you should do those deviations, when you can justify these exceptions from the rules. So when can we justify using a pie chart or a donut chart? Well, we already talked about one of these cases when, for example, we have two categories, retail and online sales. I'll remove the previous year from the filter context. But we can see that when we compare these four chart types, the pie and the donut chart are not necessarily going to be more effective than a bar chart or a dot plot. This is just a scatter plot with one axis. Now, you might have your own subjective feelings about that, but so will your users. The fact of the matter is that this is entirely viable, showing the data in this way, particularly if your users find that to be useful for them. Now, what are two other examples? Well, let's say we're trying to break down our cost of goods sold, so we're just focused on our cost. If we really wanted the precision of looking at our cost of goods sold and then the various cost types like direct material, direct labor, fixed overhead, uh, vari variable overhead, we could show this in the waterfall to get that precision to showing them adding up to the total, but we could also show it as a pie or donut chart. For example, if we really want to highlight the fact that our direct material cost is accounting for much more than the others, then a pie or donut chart might make sense. We just want to give that overview again at the top of the report. That could make sense. This becomes even more logical when we're just focused on two or three categories, like we want to visualize a uh, completion of tasks in a project management dashboard, something like this. You could use the donut chart. You could use the waterfall. You could use the bar chart. It's all coming down to what makes sense in your particular design, but more importantly, what your users are going to find most valuable. There are even cases when you're really going to deviate from these rules altogether. For instance, in this case,
we have more than two or three categories, we actually have quite a few. Each one of these slices represents a country, but we're highlighting one big slice in particular to drive a narrative home. Online sales account for more revenue than stores in all of our countries combined. Now, this kind of narrative or data storytelling approach, it can be very effective. But again, keep in mind with data storytelling that Power BI is interactive. A lot of people like to talk about data storytelling and Power BI, but they forget that the user is the storyteller. You provide the framework for the narrative with the things that are on your report page or in your model, but the user is the one that's going to walk through that world, make choices and decisions by filtering the data, and they will get a different story depending on the interactions that they use. And if you craft a very specific and detailed narrative, they could break that story and you could end up with visualizations that make no sense, having a nonsensical story that falls apart. So that's just a little tangent to say, if you're planning on taking this kind of narrative approach, be careful and make sure that you account for all the kinds of interactions that can happen in Power BI so that they're leveraged to support that narrative approach rather than betraying it. So these are a few examples and we'll just kind of end with some last one talking about how you could also use these to show KPIs like at the top of the page. So a lot of wearable devices do this for example. The only thing that you want to keep in mind is that if overachievement is important, like for example if salespeople are going to get their bonus paid out at 115% of the target, if they're going to get more bonus, maybe you don't want to use a Pyre Donut chart because it can't show values above 100%. But otherwise, if that's not the case, then maybe you could use this to show, for example, certain KPIs. It's just you know, a matter of, of what people are going to find useful and what you're wanting to do, what, trying to achieve with your particular design. So to summarize what we've talked about, there are cases, many cases, when choosing pie and donut charts doesn't particularly make sense. You might instead choose for other visualization types that can be more effective. However, it doesn't mean that you should avoid pie and donut charts all the time, no matter what. There are definitely going to be valid scenarios when a pie or donut chart could be the best approach, particularly for your users. Because if you have users that find a pie or donut chart to be the most useful way to show that information, who are you to say that it's not useful? You can certainly have a constructive discussion with them about it, but at the end of the day, if that's how they're going to see the data to be the most useful and to get the most out of it, then go ahead and use it. It's not going to be the end of the world if you use a pie or a donut chart in your report. When it comes to rules like this, avoid pie or donut charts, they're useful to follow when you're short on time or when you don't have the context to understand their underlying principles, but it's much more important to understand these underlying principles that the rule summarizes because there will be times when you have to deviate from that rule in order to achieve a particular outcome or even the best outcome in some cases. That's all for now. Enjoy making reports and I'll see you another time. <laughs>So I want to tell a story and I wanted to tell this story during the video, but it didn't come up organically. So now it's coming up inorganically at the end of the video. So there's a central BI team or an IT team and they need to create some reports and dashboards for Power BI. The executives have said, we need these reports, we need them now. So they bring in an external consultant and that external consultant you know, talks to the executives, comes up with some designs, some proposals, and they look really nice, really impressive. So they go ahead, they get the green light, and they start to develop these new reports. They create the report, create the model. The model looks really nice as well. It's performant, it's organized, and the reports also look you know, just like the designs. They're also very beautiful, very elegant. So everything looks good. We launch the report, we go live, and we distribute it through the business unit. The problem is, after a few weeks, that no one is using these reports. Out of the maybe dozen people who are having a look at it, out of the 180 who are expected to look at it, 
six or so are just looking at it to be able to export data to Excel. So why are people not using these new reports? I mean, they look really nice, the model is really performant, we followed all the best practices, but they're still using the old reports, the legacy reports. When we open up those reports, they're full of pie charts and the colors are all over the place, the layout is inconsistent, the model's full of calculated columns, and it's not organized at all, but people are still using it every day. The reason why people are using it is because the person who made that model in those reports, they know the business process very well. They're talking with the business users, trying to understand what do they need and what kinds of problems do they have? What kind of questions are they trying to answer? They're part of that business unit and they started creating these models and reports out of necessity. They don't have a background in data or in software development or in data engineering or data visualization or any of these things. They just started working with what they had, going one step at a time, learning and creating the model and creating the visualizations and distributing it with the people who needed things in order to make those decisions. This kind of bottom-up organic Power BI story. And they had a lot of success with that. Now, you can follow all the best practices, tick all those boxes, and you can create something that looks really beautiful, that is super performant. But the bottom line is that if you are not engaging with the business and understanding the business process and the needs people have, the problems that they're facing and the challenges that they're trying to address, the chances of that report or model being used is very, very, very low. Now, take the person who's focused on those business processes who's focused on understanding the users, who talks to them and engages with them and focuses on that value, teach that person about these best practices and enable them to be able to do more things more successfully, more sustainably, to get more value from more data. If you can do that, wow, that is really where the value is gonna happen. That's where the lightning in a bottle is gonna come and that's when people are really going to have success with these tools. The bottom line, the moral of the story is best practices, all these rules, if they just exist in a vacuum, they're not very helpful. The most important thing, if you wanna make useful models and reports, is to engage with the business and understand the underlying process. That's all.